All right. So then without further ado, welcome everybody. And um, the first presentation we have today is from, from Dr. Ayub from Kenya. Um, for me, this is actually one of the more interesting presentations. They're all interesting, but it's less about the technical detail. He's talking about integration with EMRs. And, you know, often we think we know how to do these things, but it's only when you actually go to do it that you, you learn the real experiences and the difficulties and, the, and things like that. So, Ayub, welcome. Come tell us about your experiences. I'll start my clock. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Ayub Manya from Kenya. And I, I would like to make a small presentation just based on the work in the field. We were trying to integrate uh, an EMR with the DHIS, and we succeeded technically, but socially we had a few problems here and there. So I'll use the normal approaches of introduction, but just for that, just to let you know that our country right now is really interested in doing digitization. There's a lot of push. And we have done quite a lot in terms of internet connectivity, plenty of uh, fiber. And so we, we are doing very well in, in the digital space in terms of that development. <clears throat> but we also have a lot of standalone hospital records. Each hospital have their own small pocket here and there. So at one time, the government thought that why don't we have one big in my AMR. So we really made one custom made, and then we took it to pilot test in one of the government hospitals. I think all of us know about health information systems. Normally, data is collected from the lower health, inform health, health facilities, aggregated and actually sent for DHIS. So for practical reasons, the data collected at the lower level is actually meant for their own management use. And maybe they don't care what goes to the DHS that eventually goes to the other planners for use. So you may find that at the lower level, they don't ever complain about data being of bad quality because they are the ones who have generated it. But now when it starts to maybe aggregating forward, then you get problems like that. But when we were designing these systems, we actually made it such that interoperability can occur. And actually we tested and we saw data being able to, to work. But when we started running these both systems, we started having issues that were not very clear. And so the purpose of this is just to highlight some of the things that would give problems. So this was by pilot tested in one of the areas. It's a small health facility, a, a hospital. It is near Nairobi. That is, I'm giving you why we chose it. Being near Nairobi means it, you can easily get the server. The servers were in the city, so we, we, it was easy to get the servers. And it was also easy for some of us to travel to the hospital to, to see. So the reasons for the pilot were more of a proximity to the server, proximity to the city. And also the people were willing to take the first uh, plunge of going paperless. It was quite uh, scaring that now from there on, you'll always be doing your data on in the computers. So for this study, we, we just looked at the hospital as it is, not necessarily without a lot of science. And so we, we had some questions we were asking, for example, do your people look at the information? Is, a, is there a problem linking data from this EMR to the DHIS? And so we looked at all this. And of course, before we did that, we got some usual permissions to, to talk about it. So these are some of the things we found out. Actually, one was that it is one of the few hospitals that had, had gone paperless. All the data was from end to end. The pa patients are written, and then they, they, they go to the next, just online. I wouldn't talk about that for now, but the good thing is that people liked the whole idea of having paperless. 
and some people were happy that the computer was working very well. So that's not the scope of this, but we just noted also that the interoperability with the DHIS is very good. It works in many other areas. We have the TB system working seamlessly. We have the COVID vaccination system data flowing, also the HIV. So technically, it has been proved that it's interoperability with this other small systems with the DHIS works. But however, what this new AMR had a few problems. And so to work out around the people who are downloading data and putting in the exam and actually entering it back to the DHIS because they had gotten rid of the paper forms. And so the records officer got extra work of now just doing that because some, the linkages wasn't working very well. And some of the constraints that we actually found, one of them was the naming of the data sets, the disaggregations. We collect some data under fives, and we collect above fives or females and this. But now for the EMR collects data as age of five years and something like that. So now it means for it to quickly to interlink with the DHIS, that person has to start looking at all the ages and do it manually and put in Excel. So that's some of the things we realize that could have a problem. And we also found that, I, I, I like this as a joke that when somebody asks, do you have a tech dictionary for the country? I say, no, no, no. We've been building one for the last five years. I say, but when will you ever finish? Do you, can you finish all the dictionary at once? So no, we still have not finished, but we've been building the dictionary. So it's not there. So some of the terminologies and what, we are working on them, but they are not yet ready at this, this point. Yet we all assume that things will be seamless and all the dictionary we've been building will work. And then classification, we put ICD-11 in the new system. Yeah, and on the DHS, some areas we have ICD-11, others we don't have. So we don't. We find that practically it's not working, but yet we were assured the people that the data will just flow seamlessly. So these are some of the practical issues that we're bringing up in as much as we tell the policymakers interoperability will work, but they don't even ask how it will work, but that is the business of the IT people to make sure data talks. But for us who are not IT, we look at what is malaria. We want to know that this malaria is different from the other malaria of the other areas. And so we start having a disconnect between the technical people and the, the other people who are looking at different in a different way. We also realize that the system developers, somehow they, they agreed in principle there'll be interoperability. But when it came to working, they were not always working together, the two systems. So that is one area that we need to advise that that, that talking together is important. And the uh, training as such was not really well done. So those are the practical issues. We also found out that because now people are doing manual and entering back, we have, we are, they would raise some data quality now issues from the higher level who are seeing the data in the DHIS. So the higher level, you are saying there's quite a lot of missing data since you started having this EMR in your hospital. What is happening? And then the people will tell them, okay, you know, there are times when we don't have electricity. And so when we don't have, when our systems are down, we do our data elsewhere, but we fail again too. Feedback. So there's quite a lot of those small, small things. So in the, in the end, this is a hospital. They are more worried about patient care than actually now going backwards and start filling data to put it in the DHS to go somewhere else. So these are some of the areas that we were realizing that the higher levels are asking there's quite a lot of data missing. And then we realized that being a transactional system, data were not arranged in the traditional paper-based. And therefore, it was a bit difficult for these people who are analyzing to end that. And then we had the usual problem in the hospital, staff attrition. They, they, they cited one area in maternity where the person who was trained on working had left. And so data was not being captured in a, in a proper way. But uh, so those are some of the things. So in general, this paper shows the need for the country to adequately prepare for integration of digital systems. And this really, need to be re-emphasized that we need to prepare well, and but it is also easy to integrate one disease system like HIV, like TB, very easy because uh, quietly there is a lot of funding that will ensure that 
this close talk is done. But it becomes a challenge to integrate a complex EMR that has data that sometimes people don't care about. And so this is this is a, that's coming out that small parallel programs work very well, and I think some of the reasons I've said. And even though the system used the standards, because we insist all systems should use standards for interoperability, but again the government the, the country had some lack of common terminologies and dictionaries to support the integration. So and this is something we've been building. I told you for the last five years the house is not yet complete. We also come up about the stakeholder engagement, where people need to be told exactly why we need this data to go. And uh, one area that uh, I don't know this, it can be part of the scope of this meeting is that some stakeholders and some patients, maybe they might not like all the information coming to, to be seen to the other side. So people now start asking, why, why should my data be moving from me and going there without my consent. So there are quite a lot of stakeholder engagement that is really needs to be addressed before we actually can have a seamless interaction. And so that is one of the things. And this one's for our meeting about DHIS and EMR. We, we, we are likely to move to the EMR way. There's a lot of wave uh, for our country also has received, is likely to receive quite some good funding from the United States. So that means the, the idea of having an EMR is, is real. And if it really comes out, that means some of the areas of DHS like data entry may have to be shifted to just getting data from an EMR. And then so why should DHS therefore receive data from an EMR? And so what will be the work of the DHS? Would it just be a data repository or a data something like that and are we prepared to modify our system so that it plays that role of a very good data repository with a good analytics so that actually we maintain it in the wave of the changes like uh, emr so those are some of the the things that make you think that we need to have a close talk that once we have very good systems it will work very well so it also so this was to contribute to the, our efforts to enable data exchange between health information system the conclusion that interoperability of highly discussed in meetings, it is difficult to implement in practice. Actually, in our country, interoperability has become a, a common English word. And so, so I don't know. They, so in the meeting, the first thing the director will ask, is it interoperable? That's OK. So these are some of the things we find socially. Everybody wants and talks about it. But now we need to go deeper into the either the technical Technical have no problem. Uh, you guys are good. But now the social aspects of this, we need to really address it. I also I want to bring up as a conclusion the issue of the digital divide. In our country, I told you we are very highly advanced in terms of internet, but I didn't say the whole country. Maybe when I talk of my country, I would be talking about the Nairobi city that has very good internet. But there could be other areas that will not be having enough internet connectivity. And therefore, if we say we are all going paperless, it's not likely that we will go paperless. So we are going to have a very complex hybrid system where some people are running on a good EMR, another one is running on this, another one is on DHIS. And so our work is great. We still have to see how we can manage that complex uh, system that is coming that, and with your interoperability coming up. So you can see, the job of health information systems is still there, and maybe I still have my job even when I retire. Thank you. Thank you, Hayo, and thank you for sticking around. We even got space for one or two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, we, we, yeah, we, we actually use the, the required standards. The issues that are coming up is that the country may not have been prepared, especially how to link and the mapping. And the, the other things I also brought up is that this is a, at a hospital level. So their main purpose for the EMR is to make sure they are 
patients are catered very quickly, efficiency and everything. So no very little attention to data mapping and all these kind of things. So the standards, as far as we are concerned, were well observed, and we still have some rules in our country that you don't bring a system which doesn't have the standards. As of now, we are recommending fire, and I think almost everybody is uh, using those. Thank you. Yeah, I think funnily enough, the, the early EMR integration with DHS2 in Kenya was actually using ADX, which we're going to hear about more. But it was coming from OpenMRS at the time, and that was the common standard supported. We're going to hear more about ADX, and we're going to hear more about fire. And then um, one more question. Sure. Sorry? Okay, we've got a question at the back there first. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry, you have to use this. Uh... Can you see the questions on Zoom? Uh... So, thanks for the presentation and for sharing your experience. So, during the presentation, you have talked about signals and engineering delivery, and one of the most I think you have a different kind of most of the time is the lack of common terminology. Mm -hmm. So, I wanted to understand as a country, how are you doing? Well, like, what are you doing to address that? So, it's one of the issues that you need to about the problem. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a very easy one to answer. I had answered that we've been doing it in the last five years, we have not completed. <laughs> so, we are working on it as a priority because uh, we, we, we do a series of seminars. And I actually, I didn't know that we never agree on anything. <laughs> Sometimes what you call a book, another one say, no, it shouldn't be a book. So, so it's it's full of fun that people sit, we argue, and then eventually we come up. I think all of us will be having this is how it will work, and then eventually we give it to the the IT people who know how to make the codes and things work. So we are working on it as a priority, and we hope one day we we'll just say now we've stopped. Let's do what we have at the moment, and. Uh, I think on what I've seen on the online is not much, except somebody saying we send the presentation, right? And then he's saying, somebody's just saying that the, another challenge is to do with governance, especially in our country, where the health has been devolved and counties are free to procure, push and drop an EMR of their choice, not considering whether it, it meets the required standards or not. That, that's a question for that's not a question but a comment from uh, one of our people in the country just trying to bring more social problems to some of this integration because if you are independent you can procure your own and therefore so those are some of the that was from the online i think yeah i think i can i can also add maybe that one way that we've seen countries begin to try to address this problem of managing terminologies in particular and governance in general is engaging in efforts to create national profiles for for patient data, typically creating fire profiles. I think we might hear a little bit about that as well from Sri Lanka. I don't know. Um, but that's, that's a process which is taken off, um, also inspired quite a lot by the WHO smart guidelines work. Um, but I think we're time for our next presentations. Thanks, Ayub. And over to Hiran. Hiran. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to. I start at 15 minutes time. And when it goes off, you know, you're five minutes off. <laughs> The, the first one, the other one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
very unlikely that if I ask a question that have you ever faced and data integrity issues while sending data to DHS to, and someone says no, is it slower? Sometimes when you're working with a large amount of data, yes, it's always slow. So good afternoon. My name is Aaron Sony and I'm presenting this um, integration with ADX with my colleague Patrick. And um, we are from Swiss TPH, Switzerland. So let's start from where we are getting data. So I, I would like to give you some background with uh, Open IMIS. Uh, it's a social health protection and health financing system. And we are in Open IMIS, we're contributing to advancing the agenda of 2023, leaving no one behind by addressing the sustainability development goals, all these numbers. And um, we have implemented this in Cameroon, Chad, Tanzania, DRC, Nepal, and so on. How are we collecting data? So initially we start with enrollment. We are enrolling people in our system. It could be households, it could be organizations, it could be individuals. We are registering them using our phone app or mobile app, and then we are sending data to the server. Then it comes to health services. We have so many health facilities and people, all these enrolled people are going to health facilities and health facility, and they are receiving the services from them. Health facilities then, they are entering claims into the system. Reviewers on the scheme side, reviews the claim and checks if it's process, if they are rejected, if they are accepted, and then so it goes on. And then in the end, we are going to reimburse the health facilities. And on based on that, when we are producing reports, and that's where the DHIS2 comes in place. So there are many phases that why we are not using DHIS2 program. We started with that. And ADX is coming on the third iteration. Initially, we started with data program. We faced lots and lots of issues. In 2020, somewhere it was developed and uh, it took us around two to two months to just send data from system to uh, DHIS2. The reason is because we have lots and lots of data. We have millions and millions of insurers. We have millions of enrollments, tens of thousands of daily claims, and tens of thousands of organization units. The reason is also could be because when we started DHIS2 in 2020 and the system was developed and implemented in early 2012. So when we started, we already had millions of rows of data. And after that, we started with another iteration. We, we actually could manage the, the speed issue, but then we introduced another issues. So just to give you an idea here that um, initially when we started with fire, we were sending maximum 50,000 events in 24 hours. And then we come with another iterations there we could send 500,000 events in 24 hours. The problem here is if you are sending pages to the server and if, you, if one row of data has an issue, the whole page will fail and that will create the snowball effect. Why are we not using the dataset API then? Dataset API is good, but the problem is the UID. That was the biggest problem for us because when you are sending data, DHIS2 is creating their own UID, which, is, which, is, which has nothing to do with the business code. It is possible to do that, but still, like let's take an example of um, category option combo. It allows us to send data with code, business code. What happens when you when data arrives on the DHIS2 server, it creates its own UID. And then on our side, we then have to map them to just know which uh, combo option is for which UID on DHIS2. 
And that was the reason that we are we, we start to avoiding data set API. The other reason we decided to not to use it is because the ADX. So what is ADX then? As you can see here, it is ADX is managed by IHE and it uses the XML format. And the biggest advantage here, the main reason that why we moved to ADX is because we wanted to avoid the UID, which is completely not readable. And rather than that, we just use business codes, human readable codes and slices. Very simple structure. How does how, how does it look like? So I'll show you in the next slide how it looks, but just to give an idea that it, we encapsulate everything in a group and then each group then has the data values. So this is an example how it looks like. So here we can see, uh, so here's an XML. <clears throat> then you can see the exported date and everything. Then we have created the group. The group has to have uh, org unit and the period for which we are exporting the data. So here is a date, you can see the period, you can see and inside of that one, you can see the data value. So the each line is a data element. So example here we have given is the gender and the program and the value. So like we see, like we saw in the previous slide, the categories are added as an attributes in the current slice as value of this attribute. Data set category and can be added in a group. So like we saw it as a group and then the data set data elements were added into that one. The, the only thing we have to remember that the we cannot use any uh, special characters and we have to use alphanumerical for the N underscore probably for the code. And we are creating the cube model. Uh, so just to, so that you know that we are using Django here. <clears throat> so this, we are going to show you that how are we going to build the ADX? So, it's a really straightforward thing that we need to create the, to create the ADX payload, uh, such as the category, option, groups, and additionally, you will add the information required to retrieve data from your system. So we have created certain functions in, and methods in Django, which gathers all this information for you. And then it creates exactly how it looks like in that payload. And like I mentioned earlier, that you have to have the period and the org unit. So the first step, you need to find out the org unit and then the ADX group and all these things you have to fetch from your system. That's what we are doing. We are fetching everything from OpenIMIS. So the a query that will get the what, so like we all know that is what, what where, and when. So we are, we are talking about the what here, so org unit, and then filter to be applied on the query to get only the relevant what for the given period. So this is how it looks like. So here we can see the function, how it looks as we are, the example here given is the gender category. So we have defined this function where we have the category name with sex, and then we are defining male, female, and other, and it all coming for this filter Q object from Django. And this is the full ADX uh, function looks like. And these are again the same steps what we just talked about. I will not go much into detail because then it goes too technical. So once the database is provided a result, so once once we execute the function uh, which I just saw you in the previous slide, what you are going to do then, we are going to map the result to the ADX group, including the group category option. If the care provider, is on the group category. All the data will be grouped by care provider. And once ADX group with the ET, uh, with its uh, category value, the care provider could be anything, could, could be any health facility here. And then we'll format the ADX data value from the result having the same group category value. So this is very important that we keep everything in, in the same group. We don't scramble the data around. And this is the step-by-step step what we are doing in the, in the Django program. 
So first we are building the object based on the definition. So we first get the definition of the ADX. Then we are getting the org unit. And then per org unit, we are trying to fetch data. And then we are going to create the ADX cube. And then we are going to serialize this to XML and then uh, push it to the DHIS2. Does this have limitations? Yes. The problem here is <clears throat> uh, because everything is automated, it's, it's uh, very easy to ignore the fact that um, when you are creating too many options. So the example I'm giving here is, let's say, for example, you are talking about the payment status and you have four different options and then you have 50 different products. If you have the size of the family and the 10 different options and Again, you're talking about the age group with the 13 options and policy status with other four options, genders and so on. So all these things, if you do, you will come up with 208,000 category combo options. If you were doing it manually, it's, it's definitely nobody's going to do this because it's, it's, it's very cumbersome and time consuming. But because we, everything is automated by Django here, it's very easy that we ignore this fact and we just put all the options possible we have. And then if you put all this data in payload and then you try to push everything on the DHIS2, it's, it's going to stuck. It's, uh, it, there are very high chances that uh, DHIS2 will crash probably, I don't know. So that, that is the one option. Then the, uh, the, the one problem, the other problem is the creating the filter. So it's, it's very difficult to, that we cover 100% of the filter in the, in the possibilities. So what do we do? We just keep, uh, like give you an example, like for example, what is valid payment? So the valid payment is if the payment matches with whatever you were to pay and probably another one, but now what is invalid payment? So there are millions of other possibilities. So what we do, we put everything in here as a default, like if it's not valid, then we just consider it's invalid. So that's, I would consider as a small uh, fallback. And as long as the filters are valid, it will produce an output, but it does not mean that your output matches your expectation. Probably you did not consider the other invalid payment issues. So a careful testing with real data will be required to ensure your definition works well. And that's all. Thank you. These days, anybody, anytime people mention a standard, they just think of fire. Yeah. Um, but for aggregate data exchange, and has been pointed out, ADX is actually can be very, very efficient, particularly for or large bulk loading of data. Yeah, and what mm -hmm. we are doing here is uh, we don't rely on DHIS2 to aggregate data. Instead, we create cubes on Django level. Mm -hmm. We aggregate data here on our side, on the source side, and then we send aggregated data to DHIS2 so that DHIS2 doesn't have to process any data. And we just, it only has to work with the cubes. Yep. That's the same thing a lot of EMRs have to do as well. Are there any other, any questions you would put to Hiran on this? Yep, here's one. Yeah. 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 For presenting data? <laughs> so, okay, that's not what I meant. My, what I mean is uh, initially when we started, like um, when I was uh, talking about the problems we were facing, um, what we did, we actually sent each and everything to DHIS2 like every single record rather than aggregating on here on the like probably for the day, for the month or for the week, whatever the requirement was. So th that was what I mean. And um, yeah. So it was quick and uh, and AOR sometimes 50, 
So uh, having a data set uh, makes the dashboards faster too. But you still use the added value of DHS2, which is combination of data from different sources. It's not just a dashboard. Yeah, I think it's a gen general challenge if you've got to integrate, kind of, particularly if you've got in an individual data system and you want to feed it into the aggregate. You basically have two choices. You're either going to aggregate it in the individual level system and send the aggregate reports, or you're going to send it as tracker data and aggregate it within DHS2. But there's lots of advantages to aggregating it at source, right? Like uh, if the EMR can generate its own indicators, for example, there's security implications. You don't have to worry about the transmission of individual data, but also as a more simplistic or simple payload. And one of the nice things about ADX, I think you pointed out, is you don't have to worry about the nightmare of category option combo. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Anyway, guys, I think yeah. we, we we better move on. Thanks very much. Yeah. So I would like to tell one more thing about the ADX is because ADX is like human readable format and it's very easy to read. And it's an XML. You can also send same data source to any other system if you like. Yeah. So if you have other systems where you can want to where you want to have similar data, you can pass on straight to the other systems. But there is a jungle module for that, so we have to look up. So it's a jungle module, so you have the link at the end, so the application is the one. And uh, so if you use Django, then you can use this uh, Django ID module and, uh, and use the same app. Yeah, so here is the, the references, if you would like to have a look. Yep. Cool. Thank yep. you. Right, thank we'll you. have to bring the, the Django and ADX love fest to an end for the moment. <laughs> I, I think the next presentation is, I don't know who is presenting, is it Priya? Okay. Thanks, let's give a round, Virant. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Like, um, I am pleased to present. Like, uh, on behalf of my team, I'm Dr. Gobika Priyanand uh, from Health Information Unit, Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka. So basically, my abstract is our abstract is based on integration and strengthening of uh, primary healthcare information system, empowering through the DHS two based uh, decision support dashboard. So this is our outline, what we are going to discuss today. And mainly I'm going to focus on the, uh, we are talking about the Sri Lanka. So I wanted to give an overview of uh, our Sri Lanka, uh, what is Sri Lanka and the system uh, digital health journey of our uh, country. So our location is like uh, where we have been located island nation which is in the Southeast Asia. We are, it is an, uh, covers of, uh, around 65,600 and square kilometers and we are we having the um, population of um, um, 21.8 million people and we are we have like around 342 persons per square kilometer there is a density the population density is 342 persons and we have we have a 
healthcare expenditure of 3.5% GDP, that is nearly a USD of 369. And we have uh, we are proud to say that we provide a free healthcare at the point of delivery to every Sri Lankans. So basically why I am explaining this is like why we need the digital health system for this and why how much we have been, our journey has been good. And there are, we are giving the um, uh, services through 1,085 healthcare institutions, state healthcare institutions, which is basically providing 90% with the inward care and 50% by the outpatient care. And this is like, these are the milestones of achievements we have been uh, done through the health information systems. Where the diseases has been eliminated so far is malaria, filaria, polio, rubella, and the measles. And where the life expectancy is usually for the female is 78.6 and uh, for the male is 72%, 72, 72, yes. And for the neonatal mortality rate of ours is like 6.5 per thousand live births and the infant mortality rate for 9.1 per thousand live births. And our maternal mortality rate is around 39.3 per 100,000 live births. And we have a high remarkable and um, institutional uh, delivery rates of 99.9 percentage. So that's real achievements in our milestones of healthcare journey. And this, like we have the digital health landscape, which is for the continuous improvement and the adaptation we had with the support of WHO and the global fund, we had a um, digital health landscape development was done in during the February to 2019. So this is what we had the level of implementation at the state sector level and the client level and the institution and regional and national levels. These are the systems during 2019. And later on, there are many systems has been added on to this. And we wanted to um, say that there are services and applications which are based on WHO classifications uh, on digital health interventions, around 16 health system managers and five healthcare providers with two data servers. And currently we have one level, like previously, in, this is around 2019, and now we have the one client level as well. And in Sri Lanka, digital health blueprint is created to resolve mainly the health data silos in current ecosystem. And we have developed with the support of Global Fund and which is aligns with the open health information exchange architecture, and which enables us the open HIE reference technologies as well. So these are the basic ideas of our healthcare journey. And following that, the precise uh, and the detailed will be explained by our expert, health informatics expert, Dr. Chamin Davida Bardana. Over to you, sir. Um, so that has been the sort of uh, introduction to the health system, and uh, we had a very good uh, primary health, um, public health uh, system in the country. Uh, we spend so little, but we have achieved so much. So uh, communicable diseases are quite well controlled in the country, but the same is not true for non-communicable diseases. So that has been a huge uh, burden for uh, Sri Lanka. And as you see, 81% 80, of the total deaths are from NCDs. Um, most of them are uh, preventable deaths. Uh, so wh what's the reason? Like, you know, um, the male uh, life expectancy is so low uh, compared to female. Uh, one main issue is uh, we our free healthcare system works very well if you come to the hospital, right? But the thing is, most of the people who, with NCDs don't turn up in the hospitals to be screened or be treated uh, or followed up, uh, they just don't turn up. So we had to move to the community to catch, catch, catch them. And one uh, project uh, that has been uh, uh, implemented in Sri Lanka, supported by the World Diabetic Federation and uh, you know uh, the Diab uh, Diabetes Compass team, uh, along with the, um, uh, you know, the College of Endocrinologists and other partners, is to actually do a community screening. So they, they have selected a, a single district in the country, uh, it's called Kalutara, and they are mobilizing uh, uh, the staff in the uh, you know uh, 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 GS divisions uh, to go to the community with an app uh, and then screen people uh, for 
uh, diabetes and hypertension. And if they are found to be uh, not screened earlier or having high risks, then they get referred to something called healthy life size centers. Uh, these are small uh, sort of clinics uh, set up in uh, the primary health care units of the uh, country. Um, and we run a cloud-based uh, solution uh, to do, um, it's actually part of the uh, World Bank project, uh, where we do uh, CVD risk uh, assessments uh, based on WHO uh, criteria and uh, do some screening tests as well. And if they are diagnosed, then they move to a, a different category of uh, care um, and uh, you know, um, then being followed up. Uh, as I think um, Andreas highlighted, most of these places do already have some legacy systems uh, and they are not interoperable. Um, so the challenge was actually uh, to uh, have a uh, sort of interoperable uh, platform where we can uh, follow these uh, screen patients um, uh, through their uh, continuum of, of care. And then uh, for the management of the program, as well as the NCD, uh, you know, the national level uh, control programs to have uh, relevant data uh, so um, to support the program management. And the app that was developed uh, is actually um, supported by this uh, OpenSRP. Um, and uh, 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 many partners were involved in development of that. Uh, the Cloud HIMS is a web-based uh, solution that is run in the uh, HSE uh, clinics, and um, it was, you know, built by the Ministry of Health itself. We we own the co source code for that software as well. And um, the advantage of uh, feeding all of this information and creating the dashboards, that's where the DHIS2 comes from. Uh, rather than creating all the analytics uh, separately, uh, we were trying to leverage on this you know, fire store that is being created by uh, committing all the encounter data, uh, how we can uh, feed that into uh, this uh, decision support dashboards. Of course, we have not done it at your scale. Um, so, you know, <laughs> these might be issues that we have to uh, look forward to, uh, but we are capturing this individual uh, encounter data about the patients and then uh, we try to uh, use um, uh, this sort of pipeline. So uh, all the data from the community app, uh, healthy lifestyle clinics and the uh, uh, medical clinics uh, get fed into one uh, happy fire uh, instance. And that data uh, through a you know, scheduled Python script uh, daily, uh, we uh, you know, uh, iterate through the uh, different encounters and that data gets pushed uh, to the DHIS2. The problem is, uh, you know, the fire data and the DHIS2, how it, you know, expects the data does not fully tally. Um, so uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, we had uh, three connectathons. So the last connectathon is like, uh, because all these EMRs use different uh, code systems, value sets, et cetera, we wanted to do a transformation. And uh, that connectathon actually was about using IPS-based uh, structure as well as IPS-based, international patient summary-based, uh, you know, value sets uh, to, to create those, uh, you know, encounter data. So on ingestion from the um, EMRs, we do the transformation into the IPS-compatible format, and then we commit it to the uh, Firestore. So I think taking that learning uh, the Diabetes Compass team uh, created this uh, mediator mappings uh, in the Open, H, uh, Open HIM uh, platform. Um, and after that transformation, it gets fed to the uh, DHS2 to, uh, to generate all the uh, analytics. So uh, basically that's uh, what, what we have done. And uh, you know, there are key steps in integration. So uh, uh, Ministry of Health adopted the FHIR R4 standards. Um, and then also we had to, um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, legacy systems in the in the Ministry of Health. We had to de develop, you know, fire API, etc. Uh, then we had to do the mappings between the uh, current EMRs to, uh, you know, DHS to uh, supported the uh, data uh, formats. Um, implemented the level, uh, you know, relevant governance policies and tested, validated, and 
uh, also done uh, some capacity building. So uh, this journey was not very easy. Uh, so, you know, take simple thing like, you know, authentication and authorization. Different systems use different uh, mechanisms. So uh, they opted to do um, uh, token-based uh, key clock uh, solution, uh, whereas other systems use basic authentication, API keys, and stuff like that. And uh, the mapping, uh, of course, you have you have to do, and it took some time. Um, then error logging, because you have multiple systems, audits, then the time synchronizations, all of that had to be done. Um, and uh, uh, this is not live as of yet, uh, but the proof of concept has been done, uh, and we have done it with test data, and I think uh, very soon we are going um, live in Sri Lanka as well. So um, basically, uh, so uh, there are two types of uh, decision dash dashboard. So it's about you know uh, um, how much that has been screened, etc. That has required for the uh, program management aspect. Uh, you know um, these um, um, uh, like uh, the staff from the divisional secretariat are supposed to go to the clear, you know uh, field and. Um, uh, screen people, follow up, uh, etc. Uh, so some data is regarding that, um, and the other ones are mainly about uh, you know the specific diseases, so uh, diabetes related uh, indicators and hypertension related indicators that are required by the Ministry of Health um, to assess the uh, you know the impact of the uh, program. So um, these have been done uh, locally, though we have not gone um, live uh, so far. Uh, I think uh, there's plenty to be learned from the other experiences as well, uh, and I'm sure we'll be incorporating them, uh, you know, uh, into our uh, uh, future uh, plans as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting. Don't, don't, don't run away. We still have a couple of minutes for some questions. Patrick, I know you're itching to ask something. So, so you mentioned you you are taking the IPS to your script, but uh, so you are using a program on the HS2 side, or uh, you are uh, kind of having a measure on fire on the fire server that then is uh, is trans it's trans transformed to data sets. Um. So basically what happens is uh, all the encounters, uh, you know, the data is structured into a IPS-based format. So this IPS-based format, of course, is not really meant for national level single encounter data, right? So the IPS per se is for uh, unplanned cross-border data exchange. So that's, that should be a snapshot of the patient at a given time. But thing is, uh, most of the tools available, uh, for example, visualization tools for, uh, um, you know, um, these summaries can be reused if we use that particular structure in our our um, uh, data repository. So what we have done is, uh, so we are not saying we are using IPS for encounter data exchange. What we are saying is we are using the IPS based structure plus the value sets to send the data. So it's easier uh, rather than nationally to have all the EMR vendors to come in and standardize that data. If we have that common denominator of IPS and we say, everybody, please map to this one, right? Then it becomes easier for the Ministry of Health to get it done. And uh, um, not for this particular project, but in the Na National Electronic Health Record project, uh, what we have done is we have created a open concept lab um, account for the Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka. And from different EMRs, we have created those uh, code systems and value sets in that. And we have mapped it to IPS-based codes because, you know, OCL already have those, you know, ICD-10, uh, SNOMED CD, GP, you know, SNOMED uh, GPS, uh, blowing code systems. So we have done the mapping there. And the, the um, Open him mapping mediator um, has a you know built-in uh, mediator to do the mapping easily. 
So what it does is on ingestion, it takes the data, it transforms it to IPS-based uh, uh, you know, structure and format, and then uh, gets saved. Anyway, we have an uh, implementation guide uh, prepared for that as well, not directly linked to the, the project that we are talking about, uh, but nationally, that's something that we have do done, and that has been the learning taken by that uh, particular team uh, to create uh, this, uh, you know, the workflow and uh, integration. But you are not sending the IPS patient data into DHIS2? No, no. You're pre-aggregating it and sending uh, the measure, not... measure report? Or... Uh, so uh, patient level, all the clinical data is not sent. Uh, but I, uh, you know, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they create a, a, a you know, a individual record in the DHS2 as well. But okay. of course, if you if you go for a larger scale at national level, we might come up with performance bottlenecks in the future as well, right? So currently, we we read uh, read through each of the mm -hmm. you know encounters and you know uh, send that level of data. But of course, uh, in the future, we might have to. Uh, either improve the performance. I think we had an experience with the uh, vaccination. Uh, you know, uh, in Sri Lanka, we used up, uh, DHIS2 to uh, create the COVID vaccination. And that, you know, 15.6 million records from the elections uh, database we had, we were to pre-populate and we came up with some performance issues. So I think those are those are solvable, right? You, know, you might end up with... looking at ADX as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> <And> most probably. <laughs> but fire is yeah. almost compatible with ADX. And so the fire measure, which is the uh, official fire uh, resource, uh, has several modes. But one of them is really close to ADX. So it's just a formatting issue. Yeah, mm. and I think with, uh, you know, this is just a, a pro, you know district uh, that the project is run on, right? But thing is, uh, for NCD, non-communicable diseases, we don't want to look at just a district, right? So the ministry, ministry's responsibility is a whole country. So whatever the solution that we want to create, we should be able to replicate at national scale as well, right? So our learnings from here will definitely be influencing the decision how we you know, set it up nationally. Good. Thank you. And thanks to the team. I know there's four of you on it, I think. Oh, the four of us. We're moving to our last presentation for this session. Now, I know Ranga and Clifford are going to show us a uh, Android app that does fire and stuff. They wanted to give a demo, probably going to be short of time. So I've suggested they just do the presentation. And if anyone is interested, they can hang around afterwards. And Ranga and Clifford will go through a demo. Guys, are you ready? Good. Are you doing this as a twin act? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're ready. Okay, good. Mm, okay. How do we find it? Mm. How do we do this? How do we find it? So it's Moby. Moby. No, no, no. It's refresh, refresh. Yeah, I need to refresh. Added some screens since. So I guess I'll, I'll set the alarm for 15 minutes. When you hear the alarm, then you know you've only got a few minutes left. Okay. Yeah. Good, good try to be. Okay. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Ranga. Ranga Rai Matavira, but Ranga, it's fine. Yes. I'm with my colleague Clifford Shadawanyika. We are coming from his Zimbabwe. And uh, we're going to present on a system we've been developing on Android, which is conformant to both Fire and DHIS2. So I think you realize the words, the way that we've used this word conformance in the, in the way that we're going to present. So of course, I'll uh, just give a brief overview of the problem that we're trying to solve and uh, the context of the work we're doing, the use case kind of that pushed us to develop these apps. And uh, we introduced the system and um, we get in a bit into the technical 
as a security interop architecture. Um, yeah, it seems like a lot, but uh, there are more slides than points, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, uh, in the use cases that we, I mean, generally, it's known that uh, community health information systems, they, they're focused, uh, if you think of it from the server side, even from the DHIS2 side, you have, we focus a lot on uh, how we structure the information in DHIS and therefore develop um, our workflows based on the structure of the information going into DHIS2. So we often find that in a lot of implementations, people have other tools that they're using in the fields outside of DHIS2, which are sending data to DHIS2, especially coming from the community. So we're coming in to try and fill in this gap with the community level, where we try to create a new focus on the actual community workflows, instead of focusing as such on where the data is going. And then in the background, as you'll see, the interoperability occurs. So we are trying to focus mostly on the client, their workflows, rather than how the systems work on the server side. So the background of the project is a project we are, we've been involved with in Zimbabwe since it's been a number of years now. I think now since uh, earlier on, like three, four years at least minimum that we've been working in Zimbabwe in a program that is designed to reduce incidence of new HIV infections amongst at-risk groups, particularly adolescent girls and young women in key populations. So the aim is to involve these people into different programs, to train them, capacitate them, give them knowledge, give them resources in order to mitigate the factors that lead to a high incidence of HIV. So it's a large program. We've rolled out about 6,000 tablets across hundreds of organizations sometimes all reporting into the center. So some of the, you see some of, so there's a lot of uh, interaction between programs. So one of the issues about this use case is in DHIS2, we set it up as multiple programs. So when we train people, we're actually training people how to enter data into these different programs. So we're trying to simplify how they do their work at that level so that they're not clicking all around trying to do how systems work. So all the systems, we've implemented them in DHIS2. Also, we have implemented them on the Android and tested them. But of course, we're trying now to fill in this gap of usability. So the main use cases that we're dealing with in terms of what makes this system distinct, it's the concept of referrals. We are focusing on referrals. How do you do referrals in the real world? Not necessarily how the systems are doing referrals. So. Uh, we want to make referrals user-friendly. Cohorts are very common in the fields, especially at the community level, where you are dealing with multiple people at the same time. Unlike dealing with a single patient and entering data, now you're dealing with 20, 30, 40, 50 people at the same time. So often you find that these people in the field, what they are doing is they are actually going in the field with some papers, capturing information, and then later on taking these forms and entering them into systems like DHIS2. So we're trying to close this gap, give them something they can use at the point of care. Case load management, it's related, uh, but uh, it's just community workers. They, they want to see the lists of their own patients, their own clients. They don't want to see the lists of patients coming from DHIS2, which might not be related to what they're doing. Actually, it could even be a security thing where if I am working in one program in a certain facility, let's say it's a um, sex workers program and that someone else is working with adolescent girls, then at the end of the day, this person and this person, because of the way DHIS2 is, they see the same patients if they're in the same facility. So obviously I can now infer that, okay, this person is from the sex work program just by seeing them appearing on my device. So caseloads are very important. Then program management, there are different types of programs as well, besides courts, which we see as a different type of program with household programs, where programs are being done inside household with everybody involved. So these are some of the use cases which are fully, not fully accommodated in DHIS2, but we do have individual programs in DHIS2, yet we're supporting that again. So we developed a, a mobile system. We call it MobiMR, which basically means mobile electronic medical record. 
And uh, of course, that's what it means. It's Android centric. And one of the main things is it's customizable again, just like DHS2, uh, but separate from DHS2. So the reason for this uh, is that previously we had done systems that were depending on metadata customizations coming from both Fire and DHS2, but this made it quite complex to, to, to develop interop on the device itself, even though it worked, but now it was dependent on Happy Fire servers. I heard people talking about Happy Fire and DHS2 servers at the same time, and this made it a bit difficult. So instead of dealing with this complexity, in this way, we created our own server environment, which is customizable on Android. So of course, conforms to DHIS2 since everything is coming from and going to DHIS2 in this particular use case. We also interoperate with Fire. So our systems, we develop them according to Fire standards. So, so the customizability of the system is really quite um, the center of this application that you can really customize systems according to the workflows of the people in the community. So yeah, of course, like we said, it does, does integrate with DHS. In terms of those people who know Fire, in our more BMR, we call it a case because it's caseload. DHS2, you call it a track identity. Happy Fire, call it a patient. With outward and forward referrals, uh, for us, it's just a workflow. Somebody meets a client, they refer, the data goes somewhere, it's picked up. And there's some a lot of uh, interoperability in terms because we're talking about a system that's coming into a space where there are other systems, electronic health record systems, and so on, mostly supporting fire. So we're looking at basically doing this back and forth referral of patients in DHIS2. It appears as events within the DHIS2 tracker. On fire, it appears as what's called a service request. So this is kind of a mapping services in DHIS2, their data elements. Oh, on our client side, these are just services that somebody is referring to. Of course, in Fire, you have like your service, uh, your dictionaries of whatever coding mechanism you're using to refer to services. Supporting information, of course, if you're going to refer somebody, you need to give a background. DHIS to those are data elements in Fire. We store those as questionnaire resources. So, of course, security, uh, somebody else mentioned key clock. Our system is built on key clock as the central security mechanism, single sign-on and so on in the background, integrating DHIS2. We've uh, been working on some modules to, to connect the, 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 the background, the fire, the key clock to DHIS2, you know, this open ID, which is already supported by DHIS2. So we're just building on what is in DHIS2. Of course, other security mechanisms can be implemented according to need. Natural SSL, secure transfer of information, and so on. So I'll let Clifford continue. Okay. So uh, I'll try to maybe explain the more technical side of the system. As uh, uh, Ranga is working more of, as the analyst, we will analyze the business and give us the business case. And then once we got that business case, we sort of like asked ourselves, oh, what's the best way to handle the situation that is... Uh, you know, uh, defined. And we came up with a solution where we said, okay, we need a system that's very customizable that can interoperate with multiple systems and so on and so on. So as part of uh, that, we decided that we need to decouple our systems from the backend, from Fire, from DHIS, because if they are dependent on those, it makes the UI sort of inflexible. It makes it difficult was we, when you are doing integration, you tend to create forms that are aligned with what the server requires. So I said, no, if you want to make a user-friendly system, we need to do, decouple the user interface from the, from the backend. And then we created an intermediary uh, server that sort of like an ETL server that does the, uh, extra, it gets information from the, um, from the Android app and then you translate that information into what is appropriate for Fire and for DHIS. It can even post the same data into multiple programs. Like I was saying, there may be multiple programs, uh, and um, you can capture on a single form. And if that information is acquired by different programs, the backend will be able then to uh, process that information and send it to the appropriate programs, fire resources, and so on and so on. This simply then ends up simplifying the workflow for the community health worker, which is really our go-to 
look at that community health worker, ask what workflows they need, and then design the UI around the community health worker. So in terms of interoperability, this is basically where we went from. And the technology that we chose is uh, Apache Kamal. That's what we are really using to then push data from our server to all these different um, servers, including Fire and uh, and the edge. So also the architecture that we're creating allows you to, um, to cho choose how frequently the data is sent to these backends and also how to filter the data. So for privacy, maybe there's some information you don't want in DHIS and there's some information maybe you don't want in Fire. You should we, you can customize and create filters that can hide uh, that information. Okay, so we are going. Uh, we're not also going to maybe the more detailed uh, architecture of the system. So the general idea here is that we have the mobile application, and then we have our uh, mid middle T or our application our application server that then converts, and then it can it talks to the third party external systems. So maybe this is another way of trying to show that same idea. You have your client, then this is our server, and then this server talks to the departed clients. So it isolates the, the Android server, so the, the Android app from the, from the need to know the formats that are required by uh, Fire and uh, DHIS. So in our in the actual architecture of the client, the more detailed architecture, we decided to go with something similar to React and um, and uh, Redux. So where we have unidirectional flows, so it's event based, and uh, we are using Jetpack Compose for our for for our UI. And then uh, what we make sure is everything is done as an event. The reason why we chose to do event based stuff is if there's an issue. You can always try to replay. Uh, you can replay those um, those events, so it will help us with our offline workflows as well. Because we are planning to, we are supporting offline work. So if you are working offline, and when you, that event is created and there's no network, it can be stored on the phone. And then when the network is restored, it tries to replay that same event to then send the data to 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 the server. So that's why we chose to go with this uh, event-based uh, unidirectional flow kind of architecture. And then on the server side, we are using Spring Boot with WebFlux. And uh, in the, it, this is the front end that receives information from the client. And then it, it you, using mustache just for the UIs for the server, then Apache Camel that would then send data using message oriented, you know, service as in, service architecture can, uh, sends data to, to the uh, service bus, which then uh, where we, that's how we send information to DHIS and to, into, and to fire. Uh, and then here we have also an internal um, NoSQL database, Cassandra, where we can store information uh, that is coming from the app. And that information then, th that's how we catch information. And then we can then we then take that information and then send it forward, forward it on once to to the right uh, resources to the right um, application. So we also have a security. We wanted to have all of our applications being able to communicate, and uh, so one login will be able then to all the systems will know all the users. Um, so there's like a single sign-on uh, thing we are using. Uh, with key clock as the central repository for for our users and the roles that they have in our in our application and all the other systems will then collect data about users from there. So even if a client saves the the, the fire will also know the exact user and store that information correctly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, so this is the data integration in detail, and uh, as you can see, when this workflow. <laughs> we synchronize DHS, so we have just this route where we can push data to um, to DHS, and we can also use another route to. So these are all Apache Camo routes that we are using then to send data in there, and then the idea there is also can do offline. So I'm just gonna go through. You wanna do the roadmap quickly? Okay, oh. not much, but we have um, we've rolled out the system, and we're now also now pushing these uh, new apps to roll out across the country in Zimbabwe along with other resources. 
And of course, these are some of the forms we hoped we could do a demo, but obviously. So for example, the sign-on, registration, and so on, different forms, caseloads, um, client referrals, outward referrals, you can select uh, the client, the referral services, you can select them. These are coming from DHS too, using some layer where you can uh, actually uh, concepts, you create concepts that are shared between DHS and this system. So some of it is just like that. So, but anyway, this is kind of, um, all these forms are customized. It's not like hard-coded forms. All these are customized within our server. Then the apps take and produce these outputs. So you just customize. So we are both customizing forms and workflows. This is the key yeah. that we're customizing yeah. workflows, not just forms. Yeah. Then so, DHS is in the yeah. back. For now, we are using JSON. Do you want to yeah. take a question or two? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think we only have a chance for maybe one or two. No. How to pick? Raga, you pick. They're asking you. I mean, we are releasing the Android apps on um, it's Apache 2. Yeah, I think so. That's it's what Apache 2 license. That's what we've chosen. Yes, it's so it's an open source license. It's compatible with uh, the DHIS 2 license and other free software licenses. Okay. So we are releasing on Apache 2. Okay. All the infrastructure from client, server, everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that at, at the moment, we're not opened up the, yeah, the, the repo because we wanted to GitHub. stabilize the architecture first so that when others join in it will be but I think within a few months yeah it will be it will be open for everyone to, to access. Okay who's gonna have the last word? Enzo <laughs> wait, wait wait for the microphone though because the people online won't hear you. Yeah. Then we really have to wrap up. There's going to be some more talk on fire on Thursday. Thank you very much. My name is Carl Smith. This is a very quick one. Uh, as it relates to integration with DHIS2, a quick scenario. If DHIS2 is offline, does the application still work and access necessary resources? Yes, uh, that's actually one of the major things that, that we wanted to do is that if DHIS is offline, as long as the server is there the application can communicate with the server even if and then also even if the server is down the application can store and then forward the, the mobile android app itself can then store and forward later some of these it depends of course on the type of event but most of the forms that you capture should be able to then send later on if there's no network so you'll be able to capture offline okay Thank you. good right thanks everybody <laughs> for attending and thanks to you to Thanks again. Thanks, I think we have experts now.